on-the-scene coverage of ACC 2015 is supported by Effiance. I'm Peter Block for On the Scene here in beautiful San Diego at ACC 2015. This is the day one wrap up. And we only had two major clinical trials presented today, so it's going to be relatively short, but a lot of information. With me is Deepak Bhatt, he needs no introduction. Deepak knows everything about clinical trials, is at the Brigham and Women's, and I should say Deepak as part of the Timmy group, because one of the trials we're talking about today, Pegasus, right. uh, you were involved in. So let me start with the first of the two trials, Promise. Promise was going to keep a promise, oh, I hate to say that, but uh, anyway, about the whole business of how we should test for patients that may or may not have coronary disease. CTA versus non-invasive testing. And the PROMISE trial is interesting because it was asking the question of what is the best strategy in order to figure out intermediate patients, not high-risk patients, I should say, and trying to figure out whether they should or shouldn't go on to have more invasive testing. And the interesting thing about the PROMISE trial is that there is absolutely no difference in the two groups. It comes down dead center uh, as being equivalent. And so I guess the question then arises, Deepak, what do we take clinically from this? So I think it was a terrific trial and very informative. It certainly doesn't support that CT is better than stress testing. So there might have been uh, some folks out there that thought, well, we'll get the anatomic information. That's as good as a cath. Let's just go to CT angio, forget the stress test. So I think that theory has been disproved. On the other hand, it looked like CT angio performed pretty well compared with stress testing in this population, which ended up being relatively low risk. So I think uh, the bottom line message is if you uh, like to do stress test to risk stratifying this patient population, keep doing it. But if at your particular center there's a particular expertise in CT angiography, that's probably reasonable too. With, with the caveats that, you know, there's got to be some consideration of the individual patient, radiation dose, so there's a bit more subtlety and a bit more physician discretion. Well, let me play devil's advocate here a little bit. because You like to do that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but when we look at the angiogram, the CT angi angiogram, in fact, I think they don't do P versus less than 0.05, but in fact, they do a little bit better uh, than when the patients go off to angiography than the stress test does. They simply have a higher percentage of positives or a lower percentage of negatives. And I think that's critical. So what I take from this is, if your CT angio is dead normal, absolutely perfect, don't bother doing a coronary angiogram. I think that's a pretty good takeaway from this. Would I think, you agree? I, I think that's consistent also with the literature about CT angiography from the emergency department. I mean, right. if the CT looks great, there isn't any sort of artifact from too much calcium, then sure. You know, if the story, on the other hand, is a great story, you know, there are might think twice about just not pursuing any further testing. Bottom line is, I, I think physician discretion, as is always the case, continues to play a big role in deciding on the appropriate testing modality. And then there's one last issue, which is the radiation. And right. interestingly, though, there is no difference overall in the two groups. When you take patients who had stress testing with some kind of thallium scan or whatever, they actually had more radiation than the CT angio. The CT folks are getting really good at reducing radiation to their patients. That's good news. That's right, the radiation doses are definitely dropping there. But on the other hand, if you like to do exercise stress testing, you know, plus minus echo, well, hard to beat the radiation dose there, <laughs> right? It's zero. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's move on to Pegasus. So Pegasus, you were involved in Deepak. Why don't you go ahead and describe the trial? Sure, so this was a large study, over 20,000 patients uh, with a history of prior MI, one to three years prior to randomization, plus a something else, that is an additional atherothrombotic risk factor, things like diabetes, multivessel disease, renal dysfunction, age over 65. So if patients had prior MI, again, not an acute MI, uh, one to three years prior, and also an atherothrombotic risk factor that are randomized, in addition, of course, to getting aspirin, to placebo, uh, the 90 milligram BID dose of ticaglor, which is the ACS dose of ticaglor, or an in-between dose of ticaglor, 60 milligrams twice a day, which ends up being a bit more potent than, say, clopidogrel 75 a day. And the overall study found a significant reduction in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, 
in either of the ticagular arms versus placebo, so a positive study. There was an increase in TIMI major bleeding with both of the dosing arms of ticagrelor. The 60 milligram BID dose looked a little bit better than the 90 milligram, both in terms of bleeding, but also in terms of dyspnea, which is a known side effect of ticagrelor. So overall, a positive trial with the caveat that there was an increase in TIMI major bleeding. When I looked at these data, Deepak, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it looked to me like a lot of difference was there in stroke. And I think what we're learning from all these dual antiplatelet studies is that if you uh, beat up on the platelets, your risk of stroke really is diminished. And that's probably interesting news. The problem is it comes at a price. All of these antiplatelet studies seem to me come at a price of increased bleeding. So those are all great points. You made several excellent points. So yes, there was uh, directionally a reduction in uh, ischemic stroke. In, in the 60 milligram dose, you know, the p-value even hit under 0.05. Uh, this is consistent with actually the overall charisma trial where there was in the overall trial reduction in stroke. Also seen in the Vorapaxar data in the post-MI patients where ischemic stroke was reduced. So you're absolutely right, but I would urge caution because in Pegasus, patients with prior stroke were excluded from the trial. Uh, and the stroke guidelines give it a class three to use dual antiplatelet therapy in patients that have had prior stroke, if that's the sole indication. Oh, so no, it, I wasn't it, implying it, that. That's oh, no, no, I know, point. but it, you know, it, it's a really a complex area, exactly who should get how much antiplatelet therapy for how long. Yeah, well, I think we have a lot to learn about dual antiplatelet therapy. So let's go to the sort of nuts and bolts of the guy out there taking care of patients. He's gonna look at you and say, yeah, 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 ticagrelor, very expensive, clopidogrel, really cheaper, not cheap, but cheaper. Why don't we just go with clopidogrel and aspirin instead of ticagrelor? What's your answer to that? Sure, so a lot of people are already doing that as a matter of fact, and I think the answer is it depends. So the data from Charisma, are subgroup data, a large subgroup, but showed that clopidogrel worked in a very similar population when added to aspirin. The downside is it's subgroup data, and some people say, look, you know, I'm not gonna change practice based on subgroup data. Other people say it's cheap, generic, once a day, I'm familiar with it, bleeding risk is pretty low, I'm gonna go with it. And I think that's a rational uh, decision. Other people are gonna say, look, you know, I'm a by the book sort of person, I only go by large prospective trials, not subgroups, I'm gonna go with ticagrelor. So if you're a by the book person, there you go, it's a new <laughs> trial for you and you can use ticagrelor. Otherwise, we have two really interesting trials. It's a good start for ACC 2015, thank you, Deepak. Thank you.